imagine my surprise when I stumble on a reference to Enlil in a book by Damien Eccles called Angels and Archangels. In the book, I show that Saturn, as he was called by the Romans, was known by a variety of other names going back in history to ancient times. The Akkadians and Babylonians called him Enlil, but I believe he was also the entity called Shemiyaza, the leader of the rebellion documented very briefly in Genesis chapter six, but uh, more expansively in the book of First Enoch. That's who this entity is. He was also known as uh, Molech. When I began to look at the entire story of the West Memphis Three saga, it really started to feel that there was an evil force that was wreaking havoc on everybody involved. It has been nearly 30 years since three eight-year-old boys were discovered naked and hogtied in West Memphis, Arkansas. Three teenagers were charged and convicted in the deadly attack. But a decade ago, the West Memphis Three were released after entering an Alford plea. Today, one of the three, Damian Eccles, was back in court. As WRG's Jarita Patterson reports, Eccles has gone from fighting for his freedom to fighting for his name. My interest in this case began when a friend of mine sent me a text asking me, what do you know about the West Memphis Three? Now, I had no idea what or who this was, so I asked him, send me some information. So he sent me a video of a retired cold case detective breaking down the story, but I left it at that. I never thought about making a video on it as at the time I was stuck down a few different rabbit holes. Now, I do believe God was trying to get my attention. He didn't get it on the first go around. So then something really strange happened. A few months passed by and I began to plan out some future videos and topics. So on a whim, I emailed this guy, Derek Gilbert of Skywatch TV. Now I never even expected him to reply, as I'm really nobody. I have a YouTube channel with only a few hundred subscribers. So to my amazement, a few days after I reached out to him, there it was. His reply accepting my invitation to come on the show. Now I had no idea what was about to happen to me. My interest in Derek was regarding his book, The Second Coming of Saturn. He makes some connections with the World Economic Forum, and that was where my interest was. So I had been looking into the World Economic Forum for a while. I was making videos about how things that they're trying to accomplish match up perfectly with Bible prophecy. So in preparation for his interview, I began listening to some other interviews he had done on his book, and I came across his interview with William Ramsey. And there it was, Damien Eccles, the de facto leader of the West Memphis Three came up in Derek's research for his book. So it could just be coincidence, or this could be one of the most intricate threads that I have ever begun to pull on. So whether or not you're familiar with this case or not, my telling of this story will have you questioning the very nature of our reality. And I'm going to point the finger at a new suspect that you never even knew was there, but he was lurking in the shadows all along. This is a mystery of biblical proportions.
Damian Eccles was uh, one of the West Memphis Three, which is a very famous case from uh, nearly 30 years ago now, where he and two teenage colleagues, all three were teens at the time, were uh, arrested and convicted of the uh, rather brutal and uh, occultic murders of uh, three boys in West Memphis, Arkansas. I think he got his reputation really was uh, made through these three documentaries that were put out by HBO. The first one was called Paradise Lost. And it was about the case of what became the West Memphis Free, which is a saga still going on. They're still in the news today. The West Memphis Three saga plays out like Stranger Things season one. On the night of May 5th, 1993, three eight-year-old boys in West Memphis, Arkansas went missing. A few days later, unfortunately, they were found in the woods dead under very strange circumstances. Rumors started to circulate overnight that these murders were committed by devil worshipers. I think the police were baffled about the motive of the crime. Why would somebody do this? Two days after the boys went missing, Steve Jones, who was the juvenile officer who discovered the dead bodies, first interviewed a young man, Damien Eccles. Now, Damien was already on the radar of another juvenile officer, Jerry Driver. Eccles had a history of psychiatric problems. He wrote dark poems, dressed in black, had a tattoo, and was a self-proclaimed Wiccan. At one point, Damien was committed to a psychiatric hospital after trying to suck the blood from a detainee when he was locked up in a juvenile detention center. Eventually, he was released and was under the care of a social worker. In his social worker's notes, she says that he said that he could become another Ted Bundy or Charles Manson. So Jerry Driver instinctively told the West Memphis Police Department to investigate Eccles. Between May 7th and May 10th, police questioned Damien three times, twice at his house and once at the police station. Eccles did agree to take a polygraph test and according to the administrating officer, Damien showed significant signs of deception. Police assumed that Damien had to have had help, so they started to also look into his best friend, Jason Baldwin. With no physical evidence pointing to Eccles and Baldwin, the investigation might have gone in a different direction. But then enters a local waitress, Vicki Hutchinson. On her own volition, Vicki goes to the police and she told them that she thought the killings were cult related. And she tells them that she wanted to play detective. Now you think that the police would tell Vicki to stay out of it, that it's a dangerous situation, that you don't want to get involved, but they say nothing of the sort. And according to Vicki, they actually encouraged her to do this. Vicky's neighbor was Jesse Miss Kelly, the third member of the West Memphis Three. Jesse mowed her lawn and even babysat for her. She claims that Jesse told her about Damien Eccles, that he drank blood and was a Satanist. On the night of May 19th, only two weeks after the murders, Vicky says that the introduction was made. Jesse and Damon picked her up and took her to an S-Bat, which is a gathering of witches. She said that she was so offended by the activity that she asked Damien to take her home. But for some reason, it took her over a week to tell the West Memphis Police Department about this. And when she did, she took her son Aaron with her, who was telling them a very interesting story about how he was best friends with the three boys who were murdered. And they would often go to that same place. And one time, they even saw a group of five men sitting in a circle, chanting and doing what men and women do. So on June 2nd, Vicki Hutchinson took a polygraph test. And according to the administrating officer, she was telling the truth. Convinced that they had their devil worshiping murderers, 
They go and pick up Jesse for questioning. And five hours later, he finally confesses. I saw Damien hit this this homeboy real bad. And he started screwing him and stuff. What did he hit him with? He hit him with his fist and brushed him all up real bad. Jason turned around and hit Steve Branch. Okay. And started doing the same thing. Then the other one took off. Michael uh, Moore took off running. So I chased him and grabbed him and held him to they got there and then I left. But the only problem is, is that initially there were some inconsistencies concerning time and what the boys were tied up with. But eventually his confession matches with the known events and the deputy prosecutor John Fogelman got search warrants for all three boys' houses and they were all arrested and charged with three counts of capital murder. The detectives trying to strengthen their case re-interview Aaron Hutchinson again. Now his story gets even crazier and deeper. He tells them that he's the only one that knows what really happened. And now he begins to say that he was there when the murders happened. According to Aaron's account, he said he got a call from Jesse the night before, asking him to bring his friends to the woods, and he did. But Aaron says that he got away before they could kill him. But it's very concerning that Aaron didn't tell his mom or the police about this right away. You think that this little kid would be completely traumatized, but he doesn't come out and say that he was a witness to the murders until after Jesse's recorded confession was leaked to a local newspaper. It's also important to note that Vicky was in some legal and financial trouble of her own, and perhaps she was trying to earn the $35,000 reward leading to the arrest of the murderers. After all, it was her testimony that led police to question Miss Kelly and ultimately got the confession. You know how they say the devil's in the details? Every detail, every circumstance of this case gets crazier and crazier. I don't even know what to believe. Many scholars revere John Milton's Paradise Lost as one of history's greatest literary creations. This epic poem tells the story of the fall of man and the fall of Lucifer or Satan. So over the years, much has been written about the characterization of Lucifer in the story. A few poets of the Romantic period saw Satan as the hero in this story and applaud his rebellion against the tyranny of God and heaven. More recently, other writers take on that same view. For example, Saul Alinsky, the guy that wrote Rules for Radicals, the book that inspired Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton, gives more than an obvious nod to this viewpoint by dedicating his book to Lucifer, the original rebel. definitive work on the case has been done by William Ramsey, who's uh, written um, a, a book on this subject. Simply just reading the trial transcripts that he included in the book uh, leads you to believe that the way Eccles and his colleagues' uh, reputations have been cleansed over the years is, uh, r is the real travesty of justice. The way it's been portrayed by the media, by Hollywood, is that they were accused because they had long hair and wore black t-shirts and that just didn't fit in with the very conservative, Christian, rural uh, mindset of, of West Memphis, Arkansas. On August 4th, 1993, the presiding judge, David Burnett, in a pre-trial hearing ruled that Miss Kelly would be tried separate from Eccles and Baldwin. Not only that, he also ruled that all three would be tried as adults. Even though the state had a confession from Jesse Miss Kelly, the defense attempted to have that confession thrown out. They claimed that it was forced. The defense's story was that police officers played an audio recording of Aaron Hutchinson in which he said, nobody knows what happened but me. Then they claimed that the interrogating officers implied that Jesse would get the $35,000 reward if he confessed. 
But the judge wouldn't have any of it. So now it's time for the Jesse Miss Kelly trial to start. In late January 1994, with a jury consisting of seven women and five men, John Fogelman gives his opening statement. We expect the proof's going to show that this defendant confessed, that he was not coerced. Uh, the, we do not contend that the proof's going to show that every word that came out of his mouth was the truth. Well, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, this statement that Mr. Miss Kelly gave the West Memphis Police Department is a false story. The interrogation techniques that were deployed against Mr. Miss Kelly at the time of his statement on June the 3rd rendered him completely incapable. They, they broke his will. They scared him beyond all measure. The proof is going to show that this defendant was an accomplice to Damian Eccles and Jason Baldwin in the commission of these horrifying murders. And we will ask you to return your verdict of guilty on three counts of capital murder. This whole trial, this whole saga, has a huge monkey wrench or wild card thrown right into it. HBO negotiated a deal with the attorneys on both sides to let a crew come in and film the court proceedings for a documentary. The directors of this film, Bruce Sanofsky and Joe Berlinger, would eventually title the film as Paradise Lost. In the years to come, they would make two follow-up films, all with the same name. When the directors initially began on this project, they claimed that it started off as a film chronicling the killer's trials. But early into the filming, they said it was obvious that they were innocent. But that's a little weird that they say this in hindsight because the first film really is the only film in the Paradise Lost trilogy that's even a little bit unbiased. So the defense tried to make their case for a forced confession a little stronger by proving that Jesse Miss Kelly is mildly retarded. No one's going to be saying that you're stupid or that you're dumb or, or, or making fun of you, but the court's going to be very interested in determining exactly at what level you are functioning, uh, how well you're able to read, how well you're able to write, things of that nature. Uh -huh. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. So if the court determines that, that uh, you are operating uh, below average, then there's a possibility that the court will not be allowed or the state will not be allowed to impose the death penalty against you. Do you understand what that means? Yeah. We've got about 10 weeks before the trial comes up in January. Mm -hmm. Are you looking forward to having the trial? For a little bit. Are you aware of any personality traits of people who are likely to falsely confess? Low IQ, highly suggestible, always attempting to solve the immediate stress factor, get the interrogators off my back and just let me go home, naively assumes that they can all straighten it out later on. It's extremely difficult for the average person to believe that someone would confess to a crime they didn't do. What I didn't like about this confession is that most of it emanated from questions right off the bat, without, without any narrative of any, any length at all, without any descriptions uh, about feelings or conversations or anything. I, I just don't understand uh, if he was in fact involved in this crime, how he made a mistake on the time factor. And the thing that really bothers me is the ligature, what was used to tie up the, the victims. Now, he certainly knows the difference between uh, shoelaces and a rope. That should have been a, uh, a signal that something was radically wrong. That's when uh, the question should have been more probing to determine whether or not he was making it up or giving a valid confession. A part of the defense's case was that there were two parts of Jesse's confession that didn't match with known events. Number one, the time. And number two, Jesse said that the kids were tied up with rope rather than shoelaces. So as they said, he surely could tell the difference between the two. It's just possible that he was confused. Remember, 
They did try to claim that his IQ was very low. He was mildly retarded. So I'm sure that he could also tell the difference between killing and not killing, whether he did it or not. So this confession is huge. So this court case went very fast, especially with his confession and the defense not being able to prove anything. Jesse received a life sentence plus 40 years. So just about a month later, Damien and Jason's trial started. Even though that Jesse was already found guilty and sentenced at this point, the prosecution could not enter into evidence his confession unless Jesse agreed to show up in person, which he would not do. In a way, it wasn't fair because everyone in the area obviously knew that he was already found guilty. So although his confession couldn't be in court, it was peripheral knowledge to everybody. So the prosecution needed to prove their case minus Miss Kelly's damning testimony. And the defense tried to create reasonable doubt by pointing the finger at anybody they could rather than Damien and Jason. So here's where things get really weird. The night that the boys were killed, a manager of a fast food restaurant that was only about a mile away from where the boys were eventually found called the police to report a man that came in who had blood all over his hands and was muddy from his shoes to his knees. Now, every part of this saga is tainted with almost a paranormal element to it. Were you working at Bojangles restaurant on the evening of May 5th of 1993? Yes, sir. Could you tell us what happened? <clears throat> well, it was about 9.30 at night. Uh, found a black gentleman sitting in the women's restroom on the commode, and there was blood dripping off of his forearm. But he had mud on his feet, uh, and he seemed to be disarrayed when I talked to him. I called the police then. What happened then? It was a female officer for the West Memphis Police Department, oh. and uh, she pulled on the light, and I saw her coming, so I went up to the front door. Well, she kept coming around. She went to the drive through window. So you did not go in the restroom? No, sir, I did not. Did you ever find this bleeding black man? No, sir, I did not. Do you have a report that you made regarding this incident? No, sir, I do not. And you're out looking for some boys, and you're out in that area, and you hear about someone bleeding. Did, that, did anything go off in your mind thinking that something may be going on? Okay, well, first of all, you got to understand it's a different area I went to. It was a different ward. I did not connect the two at all. Well, Patrolman, it may have been outside your ward, but distance-wise between the area where you were looking and where, where this restaurant was, it's not a long distance, is it? No, sir. It's really not. Okay. Did any other officer come out there that evening? Not that evening. Uh, were you working on the day of May 6th of 1993? Yes, sir. Two detectives came out and they took a report as far as what I'd seen. Uh, description of the gentleman and then they took blood scrapings off the wall. All right, Detective Ridge, what is the date that you sent the blood scrapings off to the crime lab to be analyzed? They were never sent. They were never sent? That's correct. Right, where are the, the blood samples at this time? I don't know, sir. They're lost. They're lost? Yes, sir. That's my mistake. I lost a piece of evidence. So here you have a man who is bloody, muddy, and disheveled. Then you have a cop who is already looking for the boys. Get this call. And she doesn't even connect the two. In the documentary, they really made this cop look dumb. But you need to realize something. The boys were only missing at this point, And she was more interested in finding the boys rather than tracking down this guy. It's not that crazy that she didn't make the connection. But what is crazy is the detective that took the blood scraping off the wall. He could have very well had in his possession evidence that would have exonerated the three boys. But I guess we'll never know. But things get even crazier when the defense tries to point the finger at one of the boys' fathers, John Mark Byers. The, the, the one knife that we know somebody owns is the buyer's knife. We know he owns that knife. He's got the motive, his son who he's upset with. His son was the only one mutilated. The other two weren't mutilated. 
He's, he, he's got knowledge about the area. He knows when the search is over with. He's big enough that he can carry the boys there and throw them in. He's a jeweler. He's precise enough to have, to have committed that mutilation. All of the pieces fit together with somebody in a different location killing the boys in a different location because there's no mosquito bites on them. So we know that after the boys were killed and during, they weren't outside. They had to be inside because there's no mosquito bites on them. So that means they were carried from a death scene someplace, unconscious, and brought down to the river. And they had to be killed shortly before they brought down there because they all died within a short period of time. So after they were bled to death, after they were bludgeoned and unconscious, somebody had to take those three take them to the scene and dump them. In order to do that, you gotta be physically strong enough to carry a 50 to 60 year old unconscious kid who's hogtied. Jason couldn't have done it. In his best day, he couldn't carry a little baby, those little skinny arms of his. So when we look at this whole thing, all the pieces that they tried to put together, none of it fits with Jason and just about all of it fits towards a person like Byers. When did you receive that knife? On the, I believe it was on the 8th. I've got Jane, it's hard to make this out, January the 8th, 1994. All right, and who did you receive this knife from? I received it from, uh, uh, and how did I actually receive no, it? Who did you receive the knife from? I received it from uh, uh, Joe and uh, the people with HBO okay. Productions. Okay. Bruce and Bruce Joe, and Joe. Whatever he is. All right. Yes. Upon receiving that knife, what did you do with it? I saw what I thought to be some type of substance on the knife, and actually I did not know what it was. I in turn sent this knife to uh, Genetic Design. When the knife was received by your firm. Did you or your lab run tests on that particular knife? There was a small amount of what appeared to be blood um, that was dried or tissue in uh, a, a crevice on the knife where the knife folds when it locks. Mr. Byers, I need to ask you about a defense exhibit <clears throat> number E6, this particular folding lock blade Kershaw knife. If I can approach the witness, Your Honor. Yes. Take a look at that knife. <coughs> Had that knife ever been used before? Used for what? Used for any purpose. I've had trimmed your toenails with it. I had uh, attempted to trim on some venison that I had. Uh, you attempted to trim on some venison. When was it you attempted to trim on some venison? Some one time around the Thanksgiving holidays. Do you recall being asked on January the 26th, this is on page 3, <clears throat> by Inspector Gitchell, had you ever taken that knife hunting or used it recently? you remember being asked that question by Inspector Gitchell? Specifically, no, sir. He asked me a lot of questions. All right. Do you remember giving the answer, no, that knife had not been used at all. It had just been kept up, put in my dresser, and I didn't use it. And the reason why was because of the serrated edges. Do you recall giving that answer to uh, Inspector Gitchell on the 26th? No, sir, I don't recall giving him that exact answer. I'm sure his question wouldn't have been asked exactly like your question was. All right, did Gitchell tell you, let me explain a problem we had, and you need to answer this for me. We have found blood on this knife. Did Gitchell ask you that question? I don't remember if he said there was or not. Did you tell Gitchell you had no idea how Chris's blood could be on that knife? Yes, sir, I would not have any idea. If his blood was on that knife, I would not know how it got there. Did you have any idea how human blood was on that knife? Well, yes, I would have an idea. I cut my thumb. All right. 
Is it true that you never told Inspector Gitchell on January 26th that you ever cut your thumb with that particular knife, did you? Yes, sir. It seems like during the course of the day I did tell him that. Okay. Was that during the, the taped conversation or was that after? I don't remember. Okay. On the top of page 8, and you recall being asked the question, I have no idea, no idea how it could have any human blood on it. Do you recall giving that answer? Yes, sir. Then do you recall stating, I don't even remember nicking myself with it, cutting the deer meat or anything. Is yes, that the sir. answer you gave? Yes, sir. And is that the truth? Uh, at the time when he was questioning me, I didn't rem I mean, I might not have remembered. We were getting ready to go into a trial. Uh, Did you remember on this date cutting yourself on, with the, the venison or not cutting yourself? The date that Gary questioned. The date that Gary questioned, yes, sir. I might not have remembered it at that time when he was questioning uh -huh. me, but I could have remembered it later on in the day and talked to him about uh -huh. it. Okay. Earlier that afternoon, had you given Chris a whipping? Approximately around 5.30. And this was about 5.30, and was this with a belt? Yes, sir. Okay. And approximately how many times did you hit him with a belt? I spanked him two or three times. Okay, and what part of the body did you spank him? It would have been just on his behind. Okay, was his, uh, was he wearing his pants or did you have him pull his pants down? No, he had on blue jeans. Oh, okay. So the defense tries to make it look like John Mark Byers gave the murder weapon to Joe Berlinger and Bruce Sinofsky, the directors making the film for HBO. Obviously, John Mark Byers is all over the place. But one thing we need to understand is he had a brain tumor at the time. And so that might account for some of his confusion. So now it's time for Damien to get on the stand. It doesn't look good for him at all. The prosecution begins to interrogate him about his interest in the occult and specifically Aleister Crowley. You're familiar with a fellow named Aleister Crowley? I know who he him. is. I know okay. who he is. Uh, and he's a guy who kind of professes, he's, he's a, uh, a noted author in the field of satanic worship, right? I've never, I, I know he is, but I've never saw any of his books personally. Not really much of a follower of his? I would have read him if I would have saw him, but I just okay. never... But Aleister Crowley is a guy that, based on his writings, believes in human sacrifice, doesn't he? He also believed he was God, though, so... Okay. And he also had writings that indicated that children were the best type of human sacrifice, correct? Yes, sir. Okay. But Aleister Crowley doesn't have any particular significance to you? I know who he is. I've read a little bit about him, but I've never read anything by him. Let me show you a copy of some documents. Do you recognize that? Yes. Okay. What is that? Um, diff it was this paper I had on uh, different alphabets for like translations where you could write things that nobody could read, and this was one of the forms. Oh, okay. So well, where did you have that at? Where did, when did you do that, write those things out? Sometime before I was arrested, I guess. Okay. Are you sure that you hadn't done those since you were arrested while you've been staying in jail? I don't know, I might have. Well, what, whose names are written on that document? Mine, Jason's, my son's, uh, one that says Aleister Crowley. And wait, wait, who? Alistair Crowley. Now, this is a document that you've written while you've been waiting in jail for trial, right? If you say so. Well, you wrote it, correct? At your writing? Mm-hmm. Okay. You recall when you wrote it? Not really. Well, what I'm going to ask you is that this Damien Seth Azariah Eccles, your son, he wasn't born until after you were placed in jail, correct? Yes. Okay. So if you've got his name listed on this document, then this document had to be generated after he was born, right? Yes. Okay, so this is something you've written since you've been sitting in here in jail waiting for trial. 
Yes. And what you were doing was writing out various names in different type alphabets, correct? From the way it looks here, I was practicing trying to memorize them. Okay. And one of the names that you picked out to write about was this fellow named Alistair Crowley, correct? Mm -hmm. Is that just just a total coincidence you just pulled his name out of the air? No, it's just the same book that I had with this, the different alphabets in it. It also had stuff about him in it. Well, did you have the book out there at the time you were doing this? Mm, this was just from what I remembered myself where I was practicing, trying to memorize, get okay. it all in my head. Perfect. So, so you were going over it, working on it in your head, and at that point in time, you write all this down from memory? Mm -hmm. The people that are listed on here, you've got your name on here, right? Mm -hmm. And then Jason Baldwin, which is your best friend, right? And then you've got Damien Seth Azariah Eccles. That's your son? Yes, it is. Okay. And then the only other name on this document besides yourself, your best friend, and your son is Alistair Crowley, correct? Yes, sir. This may have been what got Damien convicted. He is clearly not telling the truth. Then we have the retelling of a conversation between Eccles and Detective Rick. Talking to Mr. Eccles, did you ask him who did he think did it and why? In one area, he says he had an opinion for who could have done the murders as being someone sick and that it was some type of thrill kill. He also stated that the penis was a symbol of power in his religion known as Wicca. He also stated that the number three has a sacred number in the belief. And do you tell you anything about demonic forces? Yes, sir. He said that all people have a demonic force in them and that a person would have no control over that demonic force. Did you tell him in that statement that you had been a member of a white witch group for five years? No. Okay. I've never been a member of any group. And so if he put that in his report, you're saying that's inaccurate? Yes, I am. He made that up? Yes, I am. On question number nine, how do you think it would the person feels that did this? The answer was probably makes them feel good, gives them power. Now, I guess Officer Ridge said that too. No, I use common sense on that. Okay. If someone was doing it, then they must have wanted to. And if they were doing something they wanted to, it must have made them happy. I don't think they were doing it because someone forced them to or because they didn't want to. So in your mind, the person that killed these three kids, it's common sense that killing three eight-year-olds would make you feel good. Whoever did it, it must have. Did you also tell him that each person had a demonic side to them? I believe every person has a good side and a bad side, okay. yes. Well, did you, were those your words when you referred, when he got written down here, he stated that there was no control of the demonic portion of people? He asked me, did I think there were some people that, that, that could not control that side? I said, yes, I guess there is. It also states that Damien stated that the younger the victim would be more innocent and in turn, more power would be given the person doing the killing. Right. Okay. Did you say that? Yes. Okay, those are your words. Mm-hmm. Well, did you pick that up when you were studying to be a Catholic? No. I saw that on several movies, books. Question number 11, when he asked you, how do you think they died? And its answer is mutilation, cut up all three, heard they were in the water drowning, cut up one more than the others, is that, again, what Officer Ridge said and you just agreed? No, I had saw that on TV, newspapers, people talking. And you knew it about the drowning, correct? I knew they were in the water. I didn't know that they drowned. You knew that one was cut up more than the others? He asked me, was it possible? He said, do you think one was hurt worse than the others? I said, oh. yeah, I guess. Baldwin, Miss Kelly, and Damien Eccles were found guilty in 1994. I think it would be PR propaganda, in my opinion, of these documentaries. They they started this kind of uh, groundswell movement that raised a lot of money and public awareness in the statement that they were found innocent. 
With everything that the defense tried to pull out, the jury did not buy it. They found both Eccles and Baldwin guilty of three counts of murder. Jason Baldwin got life in prison and Eccles received the death penalty. But the story is just beginning. I kind of enjoy it because now even after I die, people are going to remember me forever. They're going to talk about me for years. People in West Memphis will tell their kids stories. It, it, it'll be like, sort of like I'm the West Memphis boogeyman. Little kids will be looking under their bed before they go to bed. Damien might be under there. Do you think that uh, this will change at all? How you choose your friends? Yeah. You, you heard what was said about him. Do you think he could have done it? About what they said? Yeah, you think he could have, do you think Damien could have killed those little boys? They made it seem like he did. What do you think? I don't know. If you were on that jury, you'd have would you have a hard time letting him go? Based on what you heard? Yeah. I would too. Would you let yourself go? This poem was considered prophetic, not just then, but even to this day by New Agers. The Last Age by Kume's Sybil Sung has come and gone, and the majestic role of circling centuries begins anew. Justice returns, returns old Saturn's reign with a new breed of men sent down from heaven. Only do thou at the boy's birth in whom the iron shall cease and the golden race arise. Befriend him, chaste Lucina. That's a reference to the moon goddess. Tis thine own Apollo reigns. guest was used also in worshiping the devil, participated in human sacrifice rituals, rituals and cannibalism. She says her family has been involved in rituals for generations. She is currently in extensive therapy, suffers from multiple personality disorder, meaning she's blocked out many of the terrifying and painful memories of her childhood. Meet Rachel, who is also in disguise to protect her identity. You come from generations of ritualistic uh, abuse? You and intense scrutiny on the activities of satanic cults. Stories of devil worship and satanic cults corrupting young minds. Unbelievable crime at the hands of satanic cults. Allegations of physical and sexual abuse of children at a babysitting service. The dark world of ritualistic child abuse. There's a widely held opinion that what happened at the daycare was the devil's handiwork. Authorities search frantically for evidence of an apparent ritual abuse epidemic across North America. Is there a well-organized plot, an insidious design right now to program and influence the minds of our children towards the occult and witchcraft? <laughs> In 1980, there was a book released entitled Michelle Remembers, written by a Canadian psychiatrist, Lawrence Pazder, and his soon-to-be wife, Michelle Smith. The book is based on a controversial method called Recovered Memory Therapy, or RMT. RMT is a form of psychotherapy that uses some questionable but remarkably interesting interviewing techniques, such as hypnosis, guided imagery, and the use of hypnotic drugs. 
Pazner was treating Michelle Smith using these techniques when he uncovered something that would be one of the biggest global controversies of all time. During one of the therapy sessions between Dr. Pazder and Michelle Smith, they recovered a horrifying set of memories. Michelle allegedly remembered being ritually abused by the Church of Satan in 1954 and then again with an 81-day ritual that supposedly summoned Satan himself. In the session, she also remembered that Jesus, the Virgin Mary, and Michael the Archangel intervened and healed all her physical wounds and blocked all of her memories of the events. So at this time, Anton LaVey was the leader of the Church of Satan, and he established it well after Michelle claimed to have had these experiences. So Dr. Pazder withdrew that claim because LaVey was going to sue Pazder and Smith. The story of these so-called recovered memories was so fantastic that it sparked some investigative journalism. Investigative journalist Paul Gresco got an interview with Michelle's father in which he refutes all the claims. The easiest one for them to discredit was the 81-day ritual. School records showed that Michelle never missed a day and there was no evidence that she was being abused. Despite all the evidence that Pazder and Smith were making this up, nine years later in 1989, Oprah had Michelle on her show and presented her story as undisputed fact. All of this controversy is now known as satanic panic. So I guess where my mind goes, does that mean that all the claims are made up? Even if a small percentage were true, then that means that there are some crazy people out there doing some crazy things. To me, it sounds like some demonic wisdom to inspire a couple of crackpots to make up a story to get rich off of book sales to minimize something that really could be happening behind the scenes. But were the West Memphis Three victims of satanic panic? Baldwin, Miss Kelly, and Damien Eccles were found guilty in 1994. I think it would be PR propaganda, in my opinion, of these documentaries. They they started this kind of uh, groundswell movement that raised a lot of money and public awareness in the statement that they were found innocent. At this point in the West Memphis Three saga, all three were in jail for life, but Damien is on death row. The movie Paradise Lost much like the book, had a few different interpretations of who the so-called villain was in the story. The way it's been portrayed by the media, by Hollywood, is that they were accused because they had long hair and wore black t-shirts and that just didn't fit in with the very conservative, Christian, rural uh, mindset of, of West Memphis, Arkansas. When you look at almost any trial, what you really have is two competing narratives. In the case of the West Memphis Three, the jury bought the narrative of the prosecution, but Damien and company had a wild card up their sleeve, the documentary that HBO was making. In my opinion, I don't think that the first movie was necessarily trying to make the boys look innocent. I think it's a little biased because it goes back and forth between them looking innocent and looking guilty. Nevertheless, there are no doubt some holes in the prosecution's narrative, but the defense failed to form an opposing narrative 
that was coherent. But then a new set of characters enter our story. Kathy Bakken and her friends, who worked for the company that was putting together the promo art for the film, they saw the movie before it was released and concluded that the boys were innocent and they formed the Free the West Memphis Three support group. I'm Kathy Bakken and I'm from California. Grove Pashley, G-R-O-V-E. P-A-S-H-L-E-Y, and I'm from Los Angeles. I'd like it if you could all tell me why, why some of you have come from so far, some I think have driven as far as cal from California, taken vacation time, spent money and so forth, to come to this fairly um, obscure in many ways hearing. I think I saw Paradise Lost the night it premiered on HBO in August of 96. And it just made me so mad that a modern day witch trial was being allowed to occur in America. I mean, it's not just the fact that they were making mistakes and getting the wrong people it looked like, but the fact that people seem to be reaching their decisions, even the, the jury, because of like things like emotions and prejudice and hysteria and their anger, and they weren't using the reason or common sense, or they weren't really even applying the law. Their argument was based on the theory that the boys were targeted because they listened to Metallica and wore black, and this was just another case of satanic panic. So along with all of this came another documentary movie, Paradise Lost 2, Revelations. In a way, this film is trying to do what the defense attorneys failed to do, and that is to put together another narrative with another villain. What'd you think of Byers? I think Byers is probably the fakest creature to ever walk on two legs. I still believe with all my heart that he is the person who killed those three children. And I have no sympathy for Byers. In the first installment of the Paradise Lost trilogy, the directors tried to make John Byers, the adopted father of one of the boys, Chris Byers, look like he might be the one who committed the murders. Apparently, he gave a knife to Joe Berlinger as a gift, and this dude turned around and gave it to the police and said that there was blood on the knife. Now, of course, this didn't work, but they were not going to give up on Byers. The entire second film sets Byers up to look like the murderer. So just like the defense attorneys do in a trial, Joe and Bruce introduce another narrative. But is this one coherent? For the film, they hire a criminal profiler, Brent Turvey. And interestingly enough, he finds new evidence that was right there all along that could either exonerate the three boys or show without a doubt that they did it. There were bite marks all over the boys. In this particular case, you have uh, the fortune of having what appears to be bite mark evidence. Not superficial on the inside caused by their own teeth. There are what appears to be bite marks all over certain parts of these children's bodies. The fact that this dude comes in and sees the bite marks right away might say something about the police work that was done. It's possible that they could have known without a doubt that the West Memphis Three were innocent, but everything isn't really the way it seems. The bite marks definitely fit Damien's M.O. Just a few years prior, Damien was in a juvenile detention center and got sent to a mental institution after he got in a fight with another detainee and bit his arm trying to suck his blood like a vampire. But of course, they didn't tell you this in the documentary because they had their sights on someone else. At this point, it's about seven years after the murders and the West Memphis Three are going through an appeal process. Jesse Miss Kelly's defense attorney and the Free the West Memphis support group hire an odontologist to review the bite marks. But keep in mind, they can only review it in a photograph. And in his opinion, he excludes all three boys from being the ones that gave the bite marks. 
But the prosecution also hired an expert odontologist, and he refutes all the claims that were offered by the defense. Bite mark evidence is better than fingerprints. So there's one more person that we gotta get their bite marks. There are so many twists in this story. That kind of stuff is like absolute proof of who did this. I mean, if they can get bite impressions, it's like, it's like a fingerprint. It's done. Yeah, they can we, identify who it is, period. Or we at least exclude these three boys. Yeah. yeah. We, that we have no question that they're innocent. So that's one way of trying to prove that. The three they've got are the three that did it. You are entitled to your opinion, but to spread your propaganda that you believe they are innocent, I think is crap. Bite marks aren't propaganda. That's solid 100% evidence. It hadn't been proven they're bite marks yet, though. It has been. And you're very convinced 100% they're guilty, right? Someone published something in the newspaper about me that was suspicious like that, that pointed the finger at me and said I was this and said I was that. I'd want to prove to okay. somebody that I hadn't, that I didn't nothing to do tell me with. what I have not done to prove that I have not been involved in any of it. I have no problem with a polygraph, sodium pentothal, being hypnotized, bite marks, or anything else, which I've submitted to every test they have asked, every question they have asked, because I know my innocence. But they take bite your bite impressions. mark impressions? I mean, if you're not convinced. That's why you're not so reluctant to do it. Uh, what if I told you that the teeth that I had before they were pulled, that the teeth that I had during it, I know the oral surgeons and all that did the work, and I would be glad to sign a release for them to send my x-rays. Will you do that? If need be. Like I said, I've cooperated with the police. And send it to Dan I won't do a damn thing for you. Do it for Dan Stiddle. Do it for your kid. Do it for the, do it, just do it to prove us wrong. Yeah. I don't have to prove one damn thing to you. If it turns out that we're wrong, we'll, we'll admit it, I promise you. So John Mark Byers is looking pretty shady at this point. So apparently John Byers had his teeth pulled somewhere after the boys were killed, but that's not really what his story is. Now, not only that, but his wife also died under mysterious circumstances at their home. But John cannot get his story straight about how he lost his teeth or at least that's what the filmmakers want you to believe. It cost me physically and mentally and all the fights and all that I got into because I went to looking for them and the bricks that hit me in the head and the knives that cut these scars on my face and the jerks that had the privilege of knocking teeth out of my mouth. Well, that's caused them three animals that provoked me so to get into a violent rage like I had. And that's what it cost me, a whole set of teeth. How did you lose your teeth? Because I've heard, lost them, but not how. Uh, because I was taking Tegretol for my epileptic seizures, and Tegretol causes periodontal disease, and they all started rotting and falling, coming out. This is 12 out, you didn't have to pull Yeah, you have periodontal disease. That's when the gums literally move away from your teeth. So which is it? Did he get his teeth knocked out in a fight or was it from periodontal disease? Eventually, Byers did provide his dental records and contradictory to what he said, they were pulled four years after the murders. In the documentary, they threw up this provocative title saying, periodontal disease is not listed as a known side effect to Tegretol usage. So I did a little bit of research and found out that many people have lost their teeth due to this drug and smoking definitely accentuates it. So John Mark Byers lost some of his teeth in a fight and he lost the rest of them due to periodontal disease. No doubt the directors of this film and the Free, the West Memphis Three support group are doing exactly the same thing to Byers as they are claiming happened to the West Memphis Three. So at this point in my research, I'm really trying to look at this with an objective point of view, and I'm not done with buyers yet. A few years after all the events happened, John's wife died in her sleep, and the cause of death to this day is listed as unknown. Even though she had about seven different types of drugs in her system, some of which were prescribed and some were not. 
I wouldn't go far <laughs> enough to say that Mark Byers murdered these little boys, but I think he had something to do with it. And I just can't figure out what. And I think there's a lot of people that probably do know. I had three or four people come to my house to look me up to tell me that they believed that my son was innocent and that they personally knew Mark Byers and that um, they believed that he was capable of, of doing a crime like that. And they said they had been to the police, but the police wouldn't listen. And I feel really bad about what happened to Melissa Byers because it concerns me that maybe she found out something that she shouldn't have. And I'd like to know what really happened to her. I'm sitting here on death row for a crime that he committed. That in itself is enough to make me have no sympathy for him, but then also the fact that he killed three little kids. Do you think Melissa had anything to do with it? I don't think she actually participated in, in the act of killing them, but I think she participated in covering it up. I, I firmly believe that she knew and I think that's why she's dead now. So the Free the West Memphis Three support group was pressuring John to take a polygraph test regarding whether or not he had any involvement in his wife's death or the three boys. So as I was watching Paradise Lost 2 Revelations for the second time, I picked up on something that at least to my knowledge, nobody else has pointed out before. Now remember, John Mark Byers' wife's death was listed as unknown. They were not accusing John of being a murderer. They weren't saying that she was murdered. But then we found this. Have you had any, any other problems with the police? Not major, no, sir. You've had problems? Is that what you're saying? I don't know. Oh, well, speeding tickets. I got a DWI one time after my wife was murdered. After my wife was murdered after my wife was murdered. The test is about to begin. Did you harm any of those boys found at Robin Hood Hills? No. Novus Ordo Seclorum, included in the Great Seal of the United States and then placed on the back of the dollar bill in 1935 by uh, uh, President Franklin Roosevelt and uh, his then Vice President Henry Wallace. Roosevelt had to change the order of the two. The front, which is the seal with the eagle on it, was supposed to be on the left-hand side of the back of the dollar bill and the all-seeing pyramid on the right. Roosevelt reversed it to make it appear as though the all-seeing pyramid was the more important uh, symbol of the two, even though it's never been used on a document, an official US government document. According to the adepts, it will take a more definite recognition of the grand architect of the universe, that's a Freemasonic reference to their concept of God, uh, before the apex stone, the capstone of the pyramid, is finally fitted into place and this nation in the full strength of its power is in position to assume leadership among the nations in inaugurating the new order of the ages. That's why that was placed on the back of the dollar bill. They believe it symbolizes America taking its rightful place atop the pyramid as we inaugurate this new golden age. And with this golden age returns the reign of old Saturn, whose uh, image by this point had been kind of rehabilitated. Yeah, he was the same as the god Kronos in, in Greece, whose uh, epithet or nickname was Technophagos, which means uh, child eater. But uh, for whatever reason, the Romans believed that he had presided over a golden age when life was easy. In fact, the temple of Saturn housed the treasury with all the gold for Rome. You know, the, the thing is, what people need to understand is that the occult is a massive, massive dimension, if I can put it that way. So many parts of the Old Testament, the Lord is warning the people and telling them, listen, don't do sorcery, don't get into witchcraft, don't do any of these things, don't do necromancy or whatever.
if you want to put it on a scale, it's like the average human being has an IQ of 100, 110. If you compare it to a supernatural being like an angel, a demon, a principality or so on, they have an IQ of at least a thousand. They have knowledge about things of the cosmos, um, the seasons, things about how you can manipulate matter and energy and so on. We as human beings get all of that knowledge. We will basically destroy ourselves, we will destroy the world. Have you had any any other problems with the police? Omission is the biggest form of lie, you know, that is uh, George Orwell. So there's a lot omitted. I think that their interest was really to make something captivating and not really to document. So uh, the term documentary probably is not accurate to, in the application to those three films. The murders of three West Memphis boys last year shocked all of Region 8. During the trials earlier this year, we empathized with the parents and relatives of those little boys. And because of television, we were able to see and hear the emotions those parents were going through. Now the parents of one of the boys find themselves once again under public scrutiny. Jenna? Since the trials, the buyers moved from West Memphis to Cherokee Village. Now they say they wanted to start a new life but now they face criminal charges. They're accused of taking $20,000 worth of property from a neighbor's house. Police have witnesses who claim they saw the buyers loading stolen items into their pickup truck, and when police searched the buyer's house, they found a few of them. Mark and Melissa Byers face additional charges in their old hometown. West Memphis police have 13 warrants for the buyers for allegedly writing over $700 in bad checks. The buyers also face other charges. When they moved to Cherokee Village, the buyers became good friends with their neighbors, John and Donna Kingsbury. Problems began when Mark spanked the Kingsbury's five-year-old. I took the flash water and I just, on the, just the plastic end, just on the back of his blue jeans. And I said, now you get home, you've been a bad boy. But the Kingsbury say the whipping bruised their son. We did have to have a restraining order put on them because I was worried about my family. Mark Byers' problems began in July. He's been charged with contributing to the delinquency of a minor. Police say he stood by holding a gun and allowed a teenage friend to assault John Shaver Jr. According to a police report, the teenager used a closed pocket knife in his fist to assault Shaver. The fight sent Shaver to the hospital with a concussion. Byers admits the knife was his. He also admits there was a gun in his car. The Shavers say Byers used the gun to prevent bystanders from stopping the fight. I think I'd be extremely... Shavers' father believes this raises serious questions about Byers. You know, there's a lot of people that's talked to me about it, which I, I hate to say it, but they think maybe he might have had something to do with the, those murders. Mark Byers says that's ridiculous. But these charges and the questions they dredge up may stick with this family forever.
Have you had any any other problems with the police? Not major, no, sir. You've had problems? Is that what you're saying? I don't know. Oh, well, speeding tickets. I got a DWI one time after my wife was murdered, and after my wife was murdered, and after my wife was murdered. As I said, I'm not quite done with buyers yet. There's definitely more than just a little something off about him. But is he the kind of guy that would kill three kids and then walk around doing all the crazy stuff that he's been doing in the Paradise Lost documentaries? The directors making the HBO films finally get Byers to sit down for a polygraph test, but he didn't want them in the room. So they set up a camera and waited outside as a respected polygraph expert takes John Mark Byers through the test. The test is about to begin. Is this the month of October? Yes. Regarding those deaths, do you intend to answer truthfully each question about that? Yes. Other than what we've talked about, did you ever wish any person would die? No. Did you harm any of those boys? No. Other than what we've talked about, did you ever think about hurting anyone? No. Did you harm any of those boys found at Robin Hood Hills? No. Test is over, remain seated, looking straight ahead. Thy rod and thy staff comfort me. And I thank you, Lord, for letting me be able to believe in that with all my heart. I hope y'all really believe in your master, the Satan, sleuth foot, devil himself, because he's not going to help you. He's going to laugh at you, mock at you, and torture you. He didn't need your help. The devil's got all the devils he needs. The good Lord said Lucifer and a third of the angels were cast from heaven. He didn't need them but he took their mind and he manipulated them and they prayed to Satan and they prayed to the devil and they had their satanic worship service. Mark, you feel better? You got that arm straightened out and had that smoke. Congratulations. Well, thank you, sir. I don't, uh, according to what we have here, the response is on the chart. I feel you're telling the truth about the issues we worked with as far as you see them as you see. Give me a high five. Thank you. I knew it was right. I knew I was innocent. And to all of you morons, fools, and idiots that thought I had anything to do with it, I am now vindicated. Maybe this will serve a point to some of y'all. And I feel sorry my heart goes out to the victims who have to be put through things such as this. Now remember, polygraph tests cannot be submitted in evidence in court, but Byers had already been investigated and exonerated by police several times. So now, hopefully, in the eyes of the filmmakers and the Free the West Memphis Three support group and the public, John is no longer a suspect. Now, if Damien and company truly are innocent and buyers didn't do it, then who did? So at this point in my research, I'm leaning towards thinking the boys are innocent. So now I'm going through all the evidence that you could find online about the court case. And what I found was quite shocking because the filmmakers left a lot of important details out of their documentaries. There's a very good statement by a psychiatrist by the name of Woods. That was a, an affidavit that was put together for his appeals in 2001. Woods took all the information that had been available and went through over it and verified everything. So he said that he was actively psycho psychotic, which is a, a psychological term for somebody who is detached from reality and said, made statements of Eccles literally being in a jail cell 
trying to move the brick so he could go into another world. And I mean, there's other statements in there where he said, I'm taking Kool-Aid so I can power my body so I can grow another arm. And there's just other things. And even some of his post release, I mean, he was released in 2011. There's some things that are very curious where like he's talking about drinking moon water and where he's talking about making New York to be in a giant energy antenna. So his belief system may be uh, impacted a lot by his psychiatric diagnoses. The second Paradise Lost documentary, Revelations, took place around an appeal process for the convicted killers. During the process, the defense hired a psychiatrist to evaluate the mental state of Eccles. They were trying to determine if his mental illness affected his competency to stand trial. The defense was trying to make it look like the antidepressants that Eccles was taking between 92 and 93 actually played a part in his manic episodes, creating what they would call a psychotic euphoria that included hallucinations and delusions that deities were transforming him into a superior being. Dr. Woods concluded that prior to and during the trial that Damien heard voices and he wasn't sure if they were real or if they were just coming from his head. He was also experiencing visual hallucinations that were personifications of others. Damien said that they were like smoke, changing shape, but present and consistent. The personifications had specific names and activities. One was Morpheus Sandman, who was a hybrid of a human being and a god. Another example was Washington crossing the Delaware. Dr. Woods writes in his affidavit to the court that Mr. Eccles saw Washington cross the Delaware with Hermes on the boat. Hermes was able to cross with Washington because Hermes was moving backwards through time. I kind of enjoy it because now even after I die, people are gonna remember me forever. They're gonna talk about me for years. People in West Memphis will tell their kids stories. It, it, it'll be like, sort of like I'm the West Memphis boogeyman. Damien also stated that at some point during his adolescence, he became to believe that he was something that was almost a supreme deity that came from a place other people didn't come from. This transformation caused him to change physically. The changes appeared to take place in his hands, feet, and hair. He acquired an entirely different bone structure that was not human. Damien also believed that he was developing stronger senses, that his eyesight was better, and his ability to smell and taste changed as well. He grew his nails so that they would be a perfect one and a half inches long. And when he would look at his hands, he could see the bones. Now, Dr. Woods concluded that all of this was consistent with neurovegetative signs seen in people with mood disorders. This period of physical change began the year before the arrest and lasted for about two years after he went on death row. Damien Eccles' lifelong struggle with mental illness took several violent turns in the year leading up to his arrest. I don't think that Berlinger and Sanofsky kept the uh, objective kind of view that you would have if you were doing an honest job of looking at a case. They involved themselves, they hung out with their supporters. When I first looked at the West Memphis Three, I really started looking at, once they got released in 2011, once I realized Crowley was involved, that's really what set me off of looking at it. But there was a lot of scratching. All these people acting in unison why are all these people from uh los angeles or hollywood supporting them and you don't know who these people but then you start looking in their backgrounds and you see their fellow travelers but what i learned from people on site is this documentary like they were getting paid there were actual negotiated agreements between family members and hbo for payments so five hundred thousand here and there and so a lot of these stuff, like you see John Mark Byers, who's passed away, grandstanding and shooting. 
he was getting paid for that. So he was kind of not being this kind of distant person. And the people who really are acting honest, they never really talked to. So you'll see buyers there, but they never sat down and had a kind of sober conversation with more Branch's actual real father and uh, Terry Hobbs. So they just insinuated a lot of the stuff. When you realize that background, that, that the whole environment was tainted with payments and these guys are getting paid like actors, it's a real problem. So as far as the entire West Memphis Three saga is concerned, if you only watched the documentaries that HBO produced and you never looked at any of the evidence, you probably would conclude that the boys were targeted and were prejudged because they wore black, specifically Damien Eccles. Because the filmmakers really do lead you to believe that they didn't investigate anybody else, but they did. On May 7th, 1993, only one day after the boys were discovered in Robin Hood Hills, an investigating officer named Diane Hester was doing door-to-door -door interviews with people who lived near the crime scene. And she writes this very interesting report. Upon conducting house-to-house -house interviews, I knocked on the door of 1401 Goodwin. The door was opened by a white male late teens to early mid 20s, approximately five foot six to five foot seven, a slim build with shoulder length, reddish brown hair, wearing jeans and no shirt. I told him who I was and that we were just checking with the neighborhood to see if anyone saw anyone or anything unusual before or since the homicides. As soon as he opened the door and saw that I was a police officer, he immediately put his right arm behind the door as if to purposely keep me from seeing it. So I explained it again that I only needed his name for my records and I asked again. Again, he asked why and would not tell me. I asked about three or four times before a black male with long corn rolled hair appeared. He came up behind the white male and said, David Beasley. His name is David Beasley in a very agitated voice. The white male stated that he had just moved here a few days prior and was from Los Angeles. I also observed what appeared to be about a four inch fresh scratch mark on the white male's chest. The investigating officer, Diane Hester, now goes to a neighbor and asks about these suspicious young guys. And she writes this. I then spoke with a neighbor of theirs, Deborah Otinger, and asked if she knew anything about these guys. She stated that they had just moved in on Sunday, the 2nd of May, and seemed to be very strange. She stated that they always seemed to leave together with the white male always opening the door for the black male. She further states that the black male is almost always dressed in black and wore a black robe with some sort of white cross or other sign on it. The neighbor also reports seeing the white male wearing a silver chain with a star or a star circle cross on it. The white male was known as King David Beasley and the black male was known as Sir Michael Williams. In the investigation report, the police note that there was a scorpion necklace that was purchased at a local store by David for Sir Michael. Eventually, police discover that these two individuals were attending a church revival on May the 5th, starting at 8.30. As suspicious and weird as these two guys are, police exonerate them. The night that the boys went missing, the manager of a fast food restaurant called the police reporting that a black male with a cast on his right arm entered the restaurant and headed to the woman's restaurant. He appeared to have blood on him and was muddy. A police officer showed up to the scene but never even took a report. The next day, Detective Ridge showed up, took blood samples left behind from the black male. He then states in court that he lost those samples. So about a week and a half after the murders, a robbery took place nearby, and the suspect fits the description of Mr. Bojangles. The robbery suspect's name was Michael Scott. 
Apparently, he asked someone for change for a hundred dollar bill. And then when change was given, he rolls up the window of his truck and then begins to drag the victim. And the very interesting part is that Michael Scott has a tattoo of a scorpion on his chest. Remember the necklace that was purchased by the other two suspicious guys. Eventually, Michael Scott is ruled out as a suspect. Apparently, the cast was very different than the one that the manager of the Bojangles describes. Nevertheless, some of the connections are very strange. The point is, is that police did have other leads and thoroughly investigated them. It really is kind of encapsulates our modern media environment or topography or landscape, the West Memphis Three. How many different elements, why people keep things out, this is kind of the way that we, have, when we look at these things, it's just a modern person in this high tech, media saturated, information saturated age. How can you really tell what really is the truth? And in this particular case, this court case, there's enough records, evidentiary records to let you know the truth. So while I'm going through all of this evidence, I found something else that was even bigger than Damien's mental state. If you want to go back to the exact things that they left out, they left out any mention of Jesse's post-conviction confessions, of which they are recorded. Those are not in the films. This is huge. Why wouldn't the filmmakers bring up the fact that Jesse Miss Kelly has on record a post-conviction confession that is way more detailed than the first one that maybe was coerced, or at least it seemed like it was coerced. I was able to obtain a recording of Jesse Miss Kelly's other confession, which is also known as the Bible confession, as he said he wanted to confess on the Bible. about it and they just kept on agging it on agging it on agging it on finally i just just said something where they just leave me alone and I, finally i told them you know i chased them and everything and called them and brought them back but none of that happened <laughs> Are you aware of any personality traits of people who are likely to falsely confess? Low IQ, highly suggestible, always attempting to solve the immediate stress factor, get the interrogators off my back and just let me go home, naively assumes that they can all straighten it out later on. It's extremely difficult for the average person to believe that someone would confess to a crime they didn't do. What I didn't like about this confession is that most of it emanated from questions right off the bat. You realize that once you make the statement, there's no turning back. 
What I didn't like about this confession is that most of it emanated from questions right off the bat. I jokingly said to Lori before that I think I, in a lot of ways I may have brought this on myself, this entire situation, because when I was a child, I knew what my passion was, I knew what my drive was, I knew what my desire was. I loved magic. And I would say to myself, you know, these names that people think of, I would say, you know, one day my name is going to eclipse all of them. I'm going to be the greatest magician there's ever been. And I had no idea that that meant I would have 20 years to sit alone in a prison cell and practice and study. We're not trash, by no means. My son was born in West Memphis. He was raised in West Memphis. And for the life of me, I cannot understand why people has got this bad image of it. So what if, if he wore a black trench coat? He's not the only one that does. You know, so what if he wore black t-shirts, black pants? Johnny Cash wears black, doesn't he? Well, I wear black. Michelle wears black. Uh, Domini wears black. It's, we're all just partial to black, I guess. I like black myself. And I'm by no means no devil worshiper, nor is he. He was going to school. He wanted to go to school to be a priest. He was faithful in the church. And he looked into a little bit of Wicca, but he, he never went to it. Because when I was a child, I knew what my passion was. I knew what my drive was. I knew what my desire was. I loved magic. It appears satanic worship may have played a role in the murders. Since the very beginning of the investigation, people all around West Memphis have come forward with stories of satanic cults. Reverend Tommy Stacy's church is down the street from where the bodies were found. One year ago, Damian Eccles told the church's youth minister he had a pact with the devil and he was going to hell. Uh, I do know that my youth director uh, talked to Damien extensively after revival that we had, and he told him that he could not be saved, that he could not uh, give his heart to Jesus. And my youth director then tried to get him to take a Bible, and he made the statement that he could not take a Bible because if he did, the rest of them would get him. In West Memphis, Jenna Newton, KIT, 8 Night News. Margaret, two teenage girls took the stand this morning, and they said they heard Damian Eccles confess to the murders of three eight-year-old boys last May. One of the girls said she overheard Damian Eccles say, I killed the three boys, and I'm going to kill two more. I already have one picked out. Later in the afternoon, when the defense began presenting its witnesses, Damian Eccles himself took the stand. He said he thought the girls were lying and that they were making up those statements. He also said he did not practice Satanism and denied any involvement in the murders of Chris Byers, Michael Moore, and Stevie Branch. Well, the biggest thing with the Memphis Three trial is this was post satanic panic era. So once a new case emerged that involved the occult, no matter what he was claiming, whether he was claiming Druidism, whether he was claiming Wicca, he openly admitted that he was familiar with Aleister Crowley. And he admitted things on that stand that you wouldn't know unless you've read Aleister Crowley's works. You know, this is not just generalized information you find in 1994. Please state your name for the court. Damian Wayne Eccles. Why did you change your name? I was very involved in the Catholic Church, and we were going over different names of the saints. St. Michael's was where I went to church at. And we heard about this uh, guy from the Hawaiian, uh, Hawaiian Islands, um, Father Damian, that took care of lepers until he finally caught the disease itself and died. Was that the reason you chose Damien as your first name? Yes, it is. Okay. Did the choosing of the name Damien have anything to do with any type of horror movies, Satanism, cultism, any of that nature? Nothing whatsoever. Okay. Immediately when he got released from prison, he was surrounded by celebrities 
and he was just surrounded by occultists. And he was diving right into the deep end when it came to this stuff. Um, I have no doubt that he's been pulled in deeper. When he was released from um, prison, maybe he was just a Wiccan, okay? And I don't say that lightly, just a Wiccan, but in comparison to the left-hand path, darker stuff that it seems that he's involved in now, uh, no doubt if Damien Eccles is doing uh, rituals, he believes that he can manipulate, okay, this world through uh, summoning and sending demons, okay? Uh, you know, getting power, appeasing demons. Uh so after I release the first episode of this series, I get an unexpected message through Facebook from a gentleman who claimed that they knew one of the expert witnesses that testified against Jason and Damien. 30 years later, and this story is still unfolding. A lot of times, especially in these cases, the devil is in the details and there's a supernatural um, force, a dark demonic force that is um, uh, causing confusion and bringing what we would call um, invisibility, not physical invisibility, but um, uh, cloaking the truth. As a child, I knew what my passion was, I knew what my drive was, I knew what my desire was. I loved magic. And I would say to myself, you know, these names that people think of, I would say, you know, one day my name is going to eclipse all of them. I'm going to be the greatest magician there's ever been. Every magic trick consists of three parts, or acts. The first part is called the pledge. The magician shows you something ordinary, a deck of cards, a bird, or a man. The first verdict reads as follows. We, the jury, find Damien Eccles guilty of capital murder in the death of Stevie Branch. We, the jury, find Damien Eccles guilty of capital murder and the death of Chris Byers. You heard what the, was said about him. Do you think he could have done it? They made it seem like he did. My brain is about to explode. In my opinion, Jesse Miss Kelly is the key to all of this. After all, it was his original confession that got Damien and Jason arrested. But was it all a lie? So right after Jesse Miss Kelly was found guilty, he was escorted back to the prison by a few officers. And allegedly the whole car ride back to the prison, Jesse is singing like a canary. What we want to talk to you about is all the stuff in the paper about a deal with Jesse. Um, we, right now we don't know what his situation is, although we think that he is more inclined to testify right now than he has been at any point up to now. The Friday that Jesse was convicted, they questioned him, the officers who took him down inquired of him what had really happened. And apparently Jesse, contrary to somebody that was innocent that would say things like, gee, I've just been 
convicted and I didn't do it and what a terrible injustice. Jesse talked all the way down there about how he committed the crime and the specific details. Unfortunately, we need his testimony real bad. The prosecution was willing to cut a deal with Jesse and maybe even remove the life sentence if he would show up at Jason and Damien's trial and testify against them in the courtroom. The prosecution really felt like Jesse was going to play ball because the judge issued him a new attorney and he was beginning to broker this deal if that Jesse would give his confession in the courtroom, what would he get in return? So my concern with Jesse's third confession, known as the Bible confession, was he just putting that together and lying so he could get a better deal because they were promising him that he wouldn't have to serve a life sentence and someday he would walk free. Ultimately, Jesse does not give the confession in the courtroom, but there's some very intriguing details of this other confession. Now, I want to mention that the dice of three little boys were murdered. Uh, if you would, on that day, if you go to Robin Hood Woods, who did you go there with? Okay. And when you went there, what happened when you got to the woods? If you had anything to drink, or if you done any Again, here I am completely baffled by this case. You got three dead kids found in a drainage ditch. No conclusive evidence at the scene. You have a taped confession. The narrative suggests that this was a satanic ritual killing, which is very highly debatable because there's no good evidence only hearsay. Then you got a documentary crew that comes in and shapes an opposing narrative that this is all satanic panic and these boys are completely innocent and they're actually victims. But then you have Damien who has a documented violent past and he has a very, very loyal friend in Jason Baldwin. This confession has all the details that the first one was missing. The confession tape is about 30 minutes long and tells of the alleged events that led up to the killings and including the actual killings. There is one important detail that's missing in Jesse's confession. Nowhere in that confession does it even slightly point to the fact that this was a satanic ritual. In Jason and Damien's trial, the prosecution called to the witness stand an expert in occult crimes, Dale Griffiths. At the time, Dale Griffiths was the leading expert in occult crimes. In looking at young people involved in the occult, do you see any particular type of dress? I have uh, personally observed people wearing uh, black fingernails having their hair painted black, wearing black t-shirts. Sometimes they will tattoo themselves. The gentleman that reached out to me through Facebook and said that he knew one of the experts on the stand trained with Dale Griffiths. And he had some very interesting inside information. My name is Tom Dunn. I kind of 
accidentally started working within this realm of ministry, uh, dealing with uh, people that uh, come out of a background of satanic ritual abuse. Uh, I worked uh, for about 10 years uh, with Pastor Russ Dizdar, who in my opinion is, was the leading man in the world when it came to this work. Man, he was gracious enough to take me around the world. We went to Germany, we went to Poland, we went to Scotland. Uh, it places all over the uh, United States um, investigating satanic crime. Imagine my surprise when Tom Dunn, who trained with Russ Dizdar for years, contacts me and says that he knew Dale Griffiths. And not only that, but was in the same room with him and Dale trained him. Dale Griffiths reached out to us and began sharing with us cases and he was retiring and he needed somebody else to kind of take over you know the phone calls that he was getting and we would get a phone call from dale and he would say hey can you take this case can you can you do this russ acquired all of dale's case files russ bought those cases off of him and um along with that dale agreed to t teach us we would meet up there in a hotel restaurant and we would spend about two hours every couple months and we probably did this about five times and dale would teach us how to do investigation there's a provocative theory out there that suggests that the police were attempting to make this thing look like a satanic crime even though there was no evidence of that or was there do you have an opinion as to whether or not there are occult overtones or evidence of occult involvement uh, in these particular murders? Well, the date being close to uh, Beltane, what a is holiday, May 1st. Also, uh, the day before that is Walpers Nut. Then you go into uh, the fact that some uh, groups, uh, occult cult groups, or, or uh, will use a full moon. Uh, in several occult books, they will talk about the life force of the blood. Usually the younger the individual, the more pure it is, the more power or the force it has. A lot of times they will take blood and store it for other services and other use. Dale 100% believed that these guys um, that the West Memphis Three, Miss Kelly, Baldwin, and Eccles were um, involved in the murder of the children. Uh, now, I didn't agree with Dale on everything. Just like anybody, they have a, a disagreement on cases or whatever, or they have a different perspective on it. So in my mind, the fact that Beltane had passed four days prior and that there was a full moon on May 5th, 1993, that is not enough evidence for me to deduce that there was a satanic ritual taking place. So why was Dale Griffiths so sure that these guys did it? And according to Dale, he said that he had heard that there were people in that area reaching out to him, law enforcement, asking his advice on stuff uh, prior to the crimes, okay? Is that why he was so sure? Or is it possible that the police were trying to coerce him into sticking with the narrative that they already formed? So one time we were talking about the case and Dale, uh, I'll never forget this, uh, he, he told us that the police in West Memphis wanted him, they asked him, would you be willing to testify that these cuts are occultic in nature? And Dale looked at the crime scene photos and he said, I'm not willing to do that. He said, I don't think these are uh, occult, you know, that the cuts on here are occultic in nature. And when he told us that, even though Dale believes they're guilty, for me, it was another confirmation at what I had been feeling that there was a strong motivation um, with the police. They're like, okay, we're going too fast in this direction. We don't want to change directions on our investigation. Um, we're going to get these guys. Well, the prosecution had the number one expert at the time testify on the stand that he thought this was a ritual, the defense had to discredit him.
What classes did you take between 1980 and 1982 to obtain your master's degree? I told you, I answered that before, none. And do you want to tell this jury that these crimes were motivated by occult beliefs? Yes. In the documentary films, they really did a good job making Dale Griffiths look like a hack expert. But in reality, Dale Griffiths was the number one go-to in occult crimes at that time. He was very knowledgeable. A lot of people would maybe be surprised, okay, at my take on the West Memphis Three case. Uh, my personal take is I am not convinced that there was a satanic ritual that took place. And I'm not convinced that Eccles, Baldwin, and Miss Kelly were the perpetrators. Now, I could be totally wrong. That's just my personal opinion. So looking at everything in the aggregate, it really feels like the police got this wrong, but they were not willing to recant the satanic ritual narrative. So at this point, there's one thing in the back of my mind that's still really confusing. Why wasn't there any blood evidence at the scene? If all three boys bled at some point, there's zero blood. I mean, the only thing that the, the prosecution has, has put on against Jesse is this wild story that he told the police. And I hope that the fact that there's no physical evidence linking him to the crime scene is, is going to have a lot of impact on the jury. And when we're talking about reasonable doubt. But, uh, but I think you need to deal with the lack of physical evidence, not just not, not to just let them get away with the fact that they were in the water and it all washed away. A crime scene that clean has to be purposefully planned done that way. Okay. That, that, that the fact that it looked washed down was not just happenstance. Right. Okay. That somebody 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 intentionally, purposefully, with great cunning and intelligence, tried to get a, get rid of every spot of blood, semen, uh, uh, mud, footprint, anything that may have been there. They purposely tried to get rid of all that. An 18 and a 17 and a 16 year old kid don't pull us off. You know, a lot of, I think there's a lot of professional killers they, who don't leave it this clean, you know. I really do believe that if the jury hears what lost serial killers are like and what they do and how they leave crime scenes, the missing evidence, the souvenirs. I have no doubt but there's a sort of killer one around that, that did these murders. I, I don't have a doubt about it. Hell, he may be in Idaho now, but I mean, but you know, I, I don't have any doubt about it. You know. you know, it is somebody who knew what they were doing, had done it before, and probably has done it since then, or will definitely do it again. The defense team makes a great point here. Even professional killers don't leave a crime scene as clean as this one. There are so many things that just don't add up. And now when you add Dale Griffiths into the mix, here you have the number one guy, the go-to guy when it comes to occult slash satanic crimes. He believes that this was a satanic or occult motivated murder. So I'm thinking to myself, there has to be more to why Dale Griffiths came up with this. So I did some digging. When police contact Dale Griffiths to obtain his professional opinion on an alleged occult crime, he has a questionnaire that police need to fill out. So in this questionnaire that police filled out, there is an entirely different narrative that never shows up in the movies. Dale Griffiths writes the West Memphis Police Department this, Upon the materials in the investigation report, some questions come to mind. The questions are of such nature to aid in the formulation of an opinion. The first question is this, prior to the deaths, were there activity known in the areas where the bodies were found? And if so, what was it? He's got about 11 questions here, but the last question that he asks is, was all the blood accounted for? So the police responded to the first question as follows. Prior to the deaths, there were reports of satanic worship in the area that included several children having seen persons wearing black and chasing them from the area. Signs have been described as being a pentagram drawn on the ground near where the bodies were. A piece of board was seen on one occasion that had a painted circle and star on the face of it. 
This board was seen by an adult who was told of it by a child who had been in the area, and the adult reported that he did see the board. On another occasion, a doll has been seen to be hanging from a rope that was suspended from a tree in the area. One of the most recent reports made was that of a friend of the victims who states that he was supposed to have been with the victims on the day of the homicides. He reported a few days before the homicides that he and two of the victims had visited the area and that while they were there, they had seen five men who were dressed in black and painted black on their skin areas. He reported to his mother that he had heard the five men to be speaking in Spanish and standing in a circle. When asked how he knew that they were speaking Spanish, he stated that he could not understand them and that he thought it must be Spanish. He reported that the five men had been seen by him and two of the victims on several occasions prior to the homicides. He talked of occasions when the men would be mean to a dog and when asked how they were being mean, he responded that they were pushing it around between them. The boy also explained that he had seen each man with a knife that was kept in some type of sheath that was worn on the belt. And then police respond to Dale's question about the blood being accounted for and they respond like this. The victim that was cut in the area of his penis was known to have died by bleeding to death. However, at the crime scene, no blood was found at all. It was felt that the bleeding could have taken place in the water or if the bleeding was done on the bank, it was cleaned with the aid of the water in the ditch. It may be of note to report to you that it was after I testified in court about the fact that no blood could be found in the area that the friend reported that a bucket was used to catch the blood. So you can see how Dale could come to this conclusion that there was all of this satanic activity allegedly happening right at the same spot and now Damien is at that spot and then these kids die and Jesse Miss Kelly confesses so it's not out of the realm of possibility that this could be an occult related crime but really it doesn't look like a satanic service or ritual happened So shortly after Damien was arrested, a local newspaper writes an article quoting a couple of Damien's old classmates at school before he dropped out. None of them were surprised that he got arrested for doing this, for killing somebody. So apparently he would walk around school with a, a skull of a cat and it was well known around school that Damien would tell people that he worshiped the devil. The idea that Damien was singled out and wrongly accused of this crime for the sole reason that he wore black and listened to Metallica is completely ridiculous when you look at the evidence and not just the movie. And time and time again, Damien is caught in his own lies. In fact, Damien's not even his name. Why did you change your name? I was very involved in the Catholic Church and we were going over different names of the saints. St. Michael's was where I went to church at. And we heard about this uh, guy from the Hawaiian, I Hawaiian Islands, um, Father Damien, that took care of lepers until he finally caught the disease itself and died. Was that the reason you chose Damien as your first name? Yes, it is. Okay. Did the choosing of the name Damien have anything to do with any type of horror movies, Satanism, cultism, any of that nature. Nothing whatsoever. So are we to believe that Damien or Michael changed his name because he was inspired by a Catholic priest? It's completely incoherent with who he is. People probably think that I'm in Satanism because usually what people don't understand, they try to destroy or ridicule it try to make it look bad or wrong. West Memphis is pretty much like second Salem right now. Because everything that happens there, every crime, no matter what it is, it's blamed on Satanism. He was going to school. He wanted to go to school to be a priest. He was faithful in the church. 
and ne the he looked into a little bit of Wicca, but he he never went to it. And I think if people looked into what to what Wicca is, they would understand it a little better. The only thing Wiccans do is worship the earth. So it seems like Damien's sister's reading off the same script that maybe the directors came up with. She says that Damien was never a Wiccan, that he never went to it, but only looked at it. But reality tells a completely different story. In August of 1993, a correction officer found a suicide note that Damien wrote. Dear mom and dad, just remember, I am a Wiccan and I will be reincarnated. I promise, I love you very much. The entire lie that the defense attorneys and Damien made up, and I suspect even the directors of the movie made up, are very, very easy to poke holes into. Nobody ever believed that Damien Eccles wanted to become a Catholic priest. There are so many small details and small things that Damien lies about that he doesn't need to lie about. It's almost like he's a compulsive liar. Damien is a self-proclaimed Wiccan and magician, and there's no doubt that he studied Aleister Crowley's magic. According to the famous occultist Aleister Crowley, magic is the science and art of causing change to occur in conformity with will. In fact, Crowley says that every intentional act is a magical act. So I want to put it out there on the table. Is it possible that Damien was practicing some sort of dark magic and he was thinking that everybody was going to believe these obvious lies? Because they sure did. So it's very well documented that Aleister Crowley played a big part in the Wiccan religion. When Wicca first started out, it was actually created by piecing different parts of ancient Druidic culture and texts that were found by a man named Gardner and his people. And the texts were incomplete. So in order to fill them in, he brought in his good friend at the OTO, Aleister Crowley, and incorporated Crowley and Satanism to complete the rituals. And then he started pulling everything together and produced the first book known as Wicca, right? Uh, so that was actually its origins. You cannot separate Wicca from Satanism just based on the origins. You, you simply cannot. Of course, anyone who's Christian understands a cult is a cult is a cult is a cult. You know, dark arts are dark arts, regardless of what label you want to place on. So over the generations now, we've seen it merge and develop and incorporate, you know, new doctrines, new theologies and things like that. It's gone away from its core roots of Druidism based Wicca into new age occultism. Cause you have Wiccans that pretty much pick and choose the gods and goddesses they worship and stuff like that. Some that adhere to the Druid ones, they'll worship Brunos and Diana. Uh, others will bring in Hindu gods. Others will bring in, you know, Japanese, you know, things found in Buddhism and stuff like that. Uh, or you even have branches that, would be they label themselves Wiccan, but would that technically be Norse? You know, they bring in Odin, Loki, you know, Thor, and things of that nature. Uh, so, <clears throat> depending upon which sect it was he was studying or claiming to be, uh, there would have been passages for reincarnation. There would have been beliefs introduced uh, as far as you don't go to heaven or hell; you just kind of roam the world. You know, so it kind of depends on what he was reading exactly as to what it was he was actually believing at the time. I want to remind you this is a fundraiser so I want you to give from your heart because these young men are kind of counting on us. <laughs> and just for the First record basic. anyone if you know someone that hasn't been able to make it here today or for whatever reason left early if you'll remind them this cauldron is going to be available for the next couple weeks to continue to add to. So. I, I'm putting money in here because I want Damien to be able to go to college outside of prison. Hey, I want him to go to a real school. Really soon. Yeah. And remember, too, that he had the courage to say he was Wiccan in adversity when he knew that it would cost him a lot. All of us who are here are here because we enjoy 
knowing that there is religious freedom, hopefully somewhere, yeah. that we all respect each other for our beliefs, for our loves, for everything that we have. They wrote it off as something, well, we don't understand that. It's got to be the work of the devil. Well, you know, Wicca, Wiccans don't believe in the devil, okay? The devil is a Christian deity. They use the devil, or they believe that the devil is something that causes them to do evil things. And in the Wiccan read, in the Wiccan tradition, those folks believe that you are 100% responsible for your actions. And they believe in the law of three. What Whatever you do comes back on you threefold. If you put out good energy, that's coming back to you threefold. If you put out negative energy and dark energy, that's coming back on you threefold. That is what the Rick Wiccan means. I know that as a Wiccan, that every religion is important to me. And if, if I felt like, even Christians, that they weren't having their right to be, you know, they couldn't <laughs> practice in their way, I would defend that. It's not about just me being Wiccan. This is about how did this affect three little boys whose murderers I personally believe went un unfounded. And there's three young men who are in jail, and one of them's there, and he's on death row just because he said, I'm Wiccan. You know, every single, um, it seemed like anyway, every single department in the United States was developing a cult crime unit or a, you know, satanic ritual crime type unit that would learn the symbolism, would understand the, the, the motivations of the crimes, and be able to investigate. And so books by law enforcement agents were beginning to be written and used throughout the 90s. Um, and so we, we, we definitely had a flurry of... Uh, direct uh, criminal activity. It hasn't gone away. It's just, uh, again, they, they think that it's going to incite panic to the community. So they're told strictly, uh, yeah, from higher-ups and trainers, not to uh, discuss it, publicize it, uh, or talk to the news people, you know, about it, that kind of stuff. Well, if one does a search, you know, and starts trying to look up satanic ritual abuse, one is uh, almost instantly confronted with the idea that it simply doesn't exist, that it's a mass hallucination effect, and the the kids were, you know, are being these memories are being planted. Uh, a lot of that was pro propagated by a foundation called the False Memory Syndrome Foundation. Um, can you see if can you, if you agree on that, and then maybe talk a little bit about uh, sure. that organization? Sure, I um I yeah, I agree with you on that. That there's been those who have said that because I've had to deal with that all along, even when I taught in the academy. You know, offices would ask, you know, because for them, they want, you know, they want the body, they want the bones. Even we, we would take victims to law enforcement. You know, I remember this one chief here locally would always say, Russ, bring us the body, bring us the bones. Well, we brought bones back from, from Pennsylvania once, um, and we've seen the crime, you know, slides, hundreds of them. So it's not that the crime's not being committed. It's, again, um, on a deeper level of satanic ritual abuse when children or others. Now, for me... I've spent over 20 years working with victims. Uh, we developed a team to go after um, the perpetrators and to find out everything we could about them. So we see the links, we see the folks. We, you know, so there's no question on our part, um, no question on on the part of hundreds of thousands of victims that have been through psych wards, in counseling centers, and so forth. I think it'd be more hilarious to to believe that all these different people had the exact same hallucination. Right. So, and what what is that number like? I mean, what what kind of diagnosed? What do we what do we have to hold on to as far as how many people have gone to psychiatrists and been diagnosed? Sure. You know, that kind of thing. Right. Back in ninety, I think like ninety two, we did a seminar. We were doing seminars at the time then, and uh, I quoted from Holly Hector, who was a hypnotherapist from Centennial Hospital in De in Denver. They, along with Hatford Ho Hospital in Chicago and others, um, developed a ritual abuse ward. There were so many cases of uh, multiple personality disorder that was connected to satanic ritual abuse that a number of uh, hospitals and their psych wards and so forth would set up a ward that would deal just with ritual abuse. Now, her ward back in the early 90s, uh, that's all they took into that section of the hospital. She, um, in a book called uh, Satan Associates by Wendell Amstead, quoted uh, from the American Psychological Association, I think. I'm not sure where she quoted, but in that book anyway, it's listed at 2.5 million diagnosed cases in 1992-93. Um, that's gone way up now to where we in 94 and 96 and doing seminars, we estimated close to 5 million diagnosed cases, majority of which are, are satanic ritual abuse. But then, here's the problem, Chris. We have on the other side, half the people we deal with never been to a psych ward, a counselor. They're undiagnosed. 
So we began to estimate statistically 10 million, and then just two years ago, Colin Ross, a Canadian psychiatrist from a big center up there, he's a world-renowned psychiatrist, so forth, in his book, uh, he's now estimated up to 10 million, half of which diagnosed, half of which are undiagnosed out there. Um, that's a lot of individuals. Damien or Michael Damien Wayne Eccles Hutchinson, whatever he calls himself, he almost had me believing he was innocent. One of the deciding factors in their guilty verdict was that Damien was blowing kisses to the victim's parents. <laughs> 